Hello and welcome. A few weeks back, we were awarded the 2020 Ig Nobel Prize for Acoustics. We were really happy about this. We received that award for our publication, A Chinese Alligator in Heliox, Formant Frequencies in a Crocodilian. The publication came out in 2015. We actually conducted the work in 2013. And I'm glad it still makes people smile to this day. We had a really good reason for doing this. Um, the main one was we wanted to know whether any other reptile than birds actually have resonances in the vocal tract when making a sound. Why is that interesting? So when human beings speak or sing, we use a combination of two things, a source and a filter. The source is located in the larynx and the filter is all the tubes of air above the larynx, between the larynx and the lips or nostrils. And essentially what happens is that the air from the lungs sets the vocal folds, or sometimes called vocal cords, into vibration. And they vibrate back and forth, and that generates a sound which is called the source sound. That source signal, generated here at the larynx, then passes through the tubes of air above it, so the throat, the mouth, or also the nasal cavities. And like any tube of air, that air has a natural elasticity and mass, which leads it to have a resonance frequency, actually several resonance frequencies. Okay? And I can illustrate that. A, 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 an empty bottle full of air, what I'm doing is exciting that air at its resonance frequencies. And what we hear are the resonance frequencies of that air. Okay, so back to our vocal tract, that tube of air in your throat and mouth is just the same. It has certain frequencies that it likes to vibrate at, and those are called formant frequencies. And what we do when we speak is we very rapidly change those formant frequencies. I'll show you in a second. But this basic idea is called the source filter theory. How do we actually control these formant frequencies in speech? Well, basically, we open and close our jaw and wiggle our tongue around. So these are two x-rays of me speaking. A rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. Here it is again. A rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. You can see my jaw is opening and closing and my tongue is dancing around in the mouth. So let's slow this down to see it a little bit more clearly. A rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. So you can see that the visible movement of the lips and the jaw is actually minor compared to the movement of the tongue. And that's really what's changing the formant frequencies, which is what we use to convey speech. So do alligators have formants? One thing we knew to start with is that alligators have a basic vocal anatomy like ours. They have a trachea and a larynx and a vocal tract. So here's an x-ray of an alligator. And his larynx is right about there. And we can see in that case he made the sounds through his nose. So there's the larynx up there. Two beautiful. Okay, so the anatomy is the same. Now we want to know whether the source filter theory applies, and in particular whether the alligator has formants. There is a method to check whether an animal has resonances. It's called the Heliox approach. Heliox stands for helium and oxygen. Heliox. Normal air that we breathe all the time contains only about 20% oxygen and that's the thing we need to live. The rest we don't, we don't need. It's about 70% uh, nitrogen and some other gases. In heliox we have the same amount of oxygen, but the rest is replaced with helium. Helium is an absolutely safe gas, non-toxic, doesn't interact with anything. So in heliox the speed of sound is faster because heliox is less dense than normal air. If you record somebody inhaling either normal air or heliox, the difference between the two recordings is simply the formant and not the vibrating tissue. Because it affects the speed of sound in an atmosphere, it doesn't affect our tissue. So basically, if you inhale heliox, your tissue vibrates at the same rate, but the resonances go up because the speed of sound in this atmosphere is quicker. Here is the Kamse saying the same sentence twice. 
once inhaling normal air and once heliox. We were away a year ago. We were away a year ago. What you can see is that the fundamental frequency stays the same in both atmospheres, but the formants shift up. And like this, we can see where the formants lie. That's it. That's what we needed. We needed an alligator to inhale heliox. So one of the really central questions in our research is, do animals have formants like those that are so important in human speech? And that's where Gator Jaeger comes in. The experiment itself was quite simple, but finding the right space and opportunity was a bit challenging. For several months, we were able to work at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, a zoological park and conservation center that hosts all species of crocodilians of the world. And there we mainly worked with big American alligators located in the lagoon and right next to it was a quarantine station. A quarantine station is for animals that recover from a medical treatment and there was a female Chinese alligator already placed in a small white tub and she repeatedly responded to bellowings of other alligators. So here was our amazing opportunity. So when you decide that you want to give heliox to an alligator, you've really got to give that bright idea a little bit of thought. Uh, after some consideration, we modified the holding container so we could both add and remove water and gas without ever disturbing the animal. We also had to come up with a way to quickly seal the top of this container with a clear membrane. This would allow us to clearly view the animal and also safely maintain the desired atmosphere that she would be breathing. If, for whatever reason, we needed to quickly access that container, that membrane could be removed in seconds without the use of any tools. It's always safety first working with animals. The only thing we still needed was a way to get our alligator to bellow once she was in the setup. And we again got really lucky. We recorded her own calls, placed the loudspeaker next to her top, and played the calls back to her. And in response, she always reliably started to bellow herself again. So everything was set. This is a simulation of our experiment. The alligator is already in an airtight space and the atmosphere above the water is ambient air, normal air. In this setup, we induced her to bellow and recorded her calls. Then we opened this vent here on the side, raised the water level and pressed the ambient air out of the tank. We closed the vent and lowered the water level and filled the resulting vacuum with heliox. Now the atmosphere above the water was heliox and we induced our animal again to bellow and recorded the calls again and like this we had recordings in ambient air and in heliox. And here is what we found. These are two calls in air followed by two calls in heliox. <coughs> They do sound different, but they also look different. You can see that there are high energy frequency bands that shift up. But there's also something that remains stable, the dominant frequency to be precise, so that's the frequency with most energy. It stays the same in both conditions, meaning that it's most probably caused by the tissue vibration and other resonance. But those frequencies that shift up must be resonances, formants. Heliox has the effects as the speed of the sound. Actually, based on the heliox conditions used here, we can calculate and predict where the hormones have to lie in that atmosphere. We examined our recordings and indeed, the hormones did shift to the level that could be predicted. In sum, this is the clear evidence that crocodilians have hormones just like mammals, just like birds. In a follow-up study, we could show that alligators indeed indicate their body size with their resonances. Larger animals produce lower formants. If we look at the tree of life again, it is now very likely that all amniotes, reptiles including birds and mammals including us, use resonances to indicate their body size. Interesting here is crocodilians and birds 
share a common ancestor with all extinct dinosaurs. So it is very probable that also dinosaurs could show others how big they are using resonances. And Stefan, don't forget, it might also help us to understand why weird dinosaurs like this Parasaurolophus, which had a, cr a crest that was actually hollow and an extension of his nasal vocal tract, might have evolved this. It may have been a way of exaggerating their body size. Isn't that cool? Thank you.